All right, everyone, this is awesome. I want to welcome all of you and uh, thank you for attending tonight's final roundtable discussion during IAFERD's three month long virtual conference. Tonight's discussion is on adaptive physical education. And uh, before I introduce everyone, I just want to say this is such an important arena and, and I think all teachers in physical education need to have some kind of conversation, discussion, or classwork in this area in adapted because we all have to make modifications and adjustments for our students. And I have seen some amazing and brilliant adapted physical education teachers. And truthfully, I think all of you uh, missed your calling. You all should be uh, in, in that world of um, engineering because you guys come up with some amazing things. So tonight's moderator is Kathy Brinker. Okay. Kathy has taught for 38 years and currently consults with school districts on this topic. Uh, she is a requested speaker at conventions on evidence-based practices for students with autism and physical, intellectual, and multiple disabilities. She, uh, while we're calling up on the uh, screen. Awesome, there we go. Sorry, Mark, give me just a second. You're all right. She continues to work with the Illinois State Board of Education on the uh, Brockport Fitness Test and serves on the ICAPE. For everyone's information, I'm sure most of you know, is Illinois Coalition for Adapted Physical Education. She uh, works, serves on that leadership team and works with her church. Our first panelist is Emma Deegans. Emma is a fourth year adapted physical education teacher at her current school district has her master's degree in special ed and literacy, and she has her TEACH, T-E-A-C-C-H certification from the University of North Carolina and serves on the ICAPE leadership team and is also a golf and track coach. Our next panelist is May Flavin. May serves at I as IAFERD's Adapted Physical Education Area Representative is in her fifth year teaching at her current school district. Uh, May also serves her, uh, or has also uh, earned her master's degree in literacy and has her TEACH certification. While an undergrad at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse, she earned a federal grant to support her work in adapted physical education. And May serves on the IK leadership team and is also a lacrosse coach. Next up is Kathy Holbrook. Kathy is a 14 year teaching veteran at her school district and also a mother to five children. Uh, she has her teaching certification in special ed, elementary education and physical education and recently completed her master's degree. She is a requested speaker at the IAFERD State Convention, an active member of ICAPE and coaches after school activities for students with special needs. Uh, our final panelist is Karen Puckett. Karen teaches at the elementary and high school levels at CASE, Cooperative Association for Special Ed. Uh, she's been teaching there for 15 years. She is also a 2019 Hellison, I believe I said that correctly, Hellison Award winner, a requested speaker at IAFERD State Conventions and a member of the ICAPE leadership team. Welcome everyone. And now it's time for me to turn it over to our moderator tonight, Kathy Brinker. Hey guys, how are you? Glad you're here. I see so many of you. I see a mix of adaptive physical educators and uh, uh, standard physical educators uh, across the state. And it's great to be with you guys. We're gonna use two formats tonight. So if you have questions, go ahead and raise your hand uh, with the reactions in the Zoom. Um, and we'll try to get to you and also we'll uh, try to monitor the chat. If we don't get to you, keep uh, waving at us and uh, we'll keep flipping through the screens and find you to make sure we can learn from you as much as uh, you can learn from us tonight. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with the first question and uh, let's, let's have fun with this. Um, can you guys talk about ways that you engage students with significant disabilities, both in your in-person and your remote learning? 
All right, hi everyone. Um, I'm gonna kick us off here with a little talk about how we do engagement. Um, for those of you who don't know, May and I teach together um, in Buffalo Grove. Um, so some of this stuff is gonna look similar on her page as well as my page, um, but just a little bit about our program in general. Um, we were in person in August, um, every day, five days a week with all of our students um, with severe, severe and profound disabilities. Um, and so, and then in October, we actually moved remote. So, and now we're back in the full in-person. So we've kind of done the flip, like I'm sure all of you have. Um, so one of the things that I did as soon as we moved um, to a, um, a remote setting was I tried to recreate the gym that we're in every single day. Um, so I know you all have seen uh, Bitmoji classrooms and all that. I wanted to make sure that my gym looked like what my kids are used to seeing. Uh, so that's what you'll see here. Uh, this, this is our gym right here, the, down to the doors and the windows and the TV. Uh, the TV even has the warm up video that we always start with. Um, my, my class that this one's for, I have two boys and three girls. Um, I know those guys look like they've got beards and aren't middle school kids, but that was the best I could do. Um, so, and even down to these little uh, squares that they're standing on, our students know where they need to be based on where these squares are throughout our activity. So um, just trying to keep it consistent, uh, some familiarity really helps with our students. Um, you know, so even down to, if you look in this picture, uh, kind of at the bottom where everyone's doing yoga, that diamond right there um, on that back wall is on our divider, which uh, we use dividers as walls. Um, and so they know that they need to match their diamond to where their next station is. Um, so in the next slide, um, may I go ahead? So in the next slide, you can see here, uh, this is exactly what our schedules look like in person. Um, so if a student is doing an asynchronous lesson, they will click on the triangle and then that will take them to the triangle activity. Now, as they click through, they'll see their icons going away on their screen. And that's exactly what we do in person. Um, and this helps with time. Um, you know, it helps with our, our students knowing when they're about to be done. Um, so we really try and keep things as consistent as possible, whether we're at home or we're in the gym. Um, another thing that we have done, uh, I, we learned how to use a green screen this year. Uh, so that was, that was fun. So we, um, we made a bunch of GIFs that we could use. So you can see myself in one of these and then uh, both May and I in the bottom one. Uh, we, like to, we like our kids to be able to see our face. Um, so using yourself in your, um, in your animations, in your slideshows, uh, we have found that it, it helps with the engagement because the student's not just looking at some random person they don't know in some random gym that they don't know. Um, so we try and make sure that we are as much as possible in our own GIFs. Um, so then we also, and May will touch on this one too, um, but our student interest is a big thing that we use while we're in person as well as remote. Uh, so like I said, we learned how to use the green screen. Um, I walked around our middle school and took a bunch of pictures. Uh, so in this bingo card here, you can see uh, I'm standing in front of our middle school. So it's just familiar places for the students. Um, and then also some of their interests like Lightning McQueen and, and Olaf. Yeah, just piggybacking off of Emma, we try to incorporate student interests as much, much as possible because that's where we see the highest level in, of engagement. So remotely, we try to use Disney characters and things like that we're teaching at the elementary and middle school levels currently. So we use some of the characters to continue to engage them. And we also did things like in the the Lightning McQueen and Disney character one, when you click on one, it took you to the activity, you do the activity, and then we were able to go back and that one would go away. So they knew they were finished with this activity when all of the um, characters were gone. This is just another example of how we incorporated student interest. We have a student who really loves Angry Birds 
And we also tried to incorporate some cross-curricular information. So we talked to the special education teacher to figure out what their goals were academically and try to piggyback off of that. So they were getting it not only in their classroom setting, but also with us. So we just incorporated movement with some of these skills as well as their student interests. This is another example. Um, we have students who are working on AB patterns and this student really enjoyed uh, trolls. So we're working on the patterns while incorporating student interests. And we have um, the circle icons in the background, which shows the continuity of the gym space. Um, so then once they pick the pattern, then they were able to find a get to the activity. And I apologize, this is a GIF, but it is, it is not moving. So you have a nice face with Emma there. And this is when we got stuck at home. So we couldn't yeah. use our green screen anymore. Yeah. Another way that we are engaging students in new different ways is utilizing outdoor space as much as possible. This also gives students a great opportunity for mask breaks. Um, and just to do something different that could carry over into a lifelong skill or something that they could do with their families at home. So I took the kids sledding and then we did a structured walk activity outside with exercises. And the exercises, again, like Emma touched on earlier, we try to use pictures of ourselves as much as possible. So that's an example of an activity we did. Lastly, um, for student engagement, from our standpoint, um, we have students who have various behavior supports and we try to use those across settings. So even virtually this task trip that says, I want to move, I need help, I want a break, we were able to throw that up on a slide for our students virtually. Um, and then we have a print off of the same sheet while they're in person. So they're using the same behavior supports regardless of what setting they're in. Then Emma, you can go on to the next one. Um, yeah, so first thens, uh, just another way to keep, you know, keep kids engaged. Uh, we use choice boards. So this student in particular has all of their choices at the bottom. They would come to PE um, and choose what they would want to do. And we'd use that kind of as a reward to get through um, some activities during class. Um, and we would provide those stars based on uh, if the student's showing expected behavior or not. So once that student reached four stars, they would get Wheel of Fortune and then we'd kind of start the whole process over again. Um, so we, we use that and as the student can increase their time on task, we give those stars uh, a little bit slower. So um, it's a great tool if you're not using choice boards or first ends, uh, we highly recommend those, especially with our students with autism. And uh, so these are, we just use these simple counters. Uh, these are super easy to make. Another thing that uh, we use across our program, uh, you can use them in so many different ways. Another thing we highly recommend um, and something that's super easy to do virtually as well. So you'll see in these next couple of slides, we have the exact same thing down to the color um, that we just click through as students are doing repetitions. And as soon as they see that they get down to one, they're all done. Um, and again, that, that helps with that visual component and students knowing when they are finished with something. Um, so, so make sure you're trying to incorporate some counters if you need them. Uh, we also use a lot of equipment to count down stuff too, so. We had a question about, do you see a big difference when you're uh, doing in-person uh, versus remote learning in terms of behaviors? Um, so I would say yes and no. Um, I think at home, sometimes the struggle is um, who the student is working with at home. Um, you know, if, if it's a younger sibling, uh, that student isn't spending much time on task, so therefore there aren't many behaviors um, we have other parents who are very good about helping and supporting and doing, um, you know, making sure their students are, are using proper form and are completing activities. And yes, sometimes there are behaviors um, through that. And 
we usually take that time to try and talk parents through, you know, let's try this next time, or, you know, here's what we can do right now. Um, and then in person, yes, with, with, the, with students knowing when they're gonna be finished, what they have to do um, with those things in place, those structures set up for them, uh, we see a big decrease in behavior in our setting. Real quick, uh, Megan wanted to know how you did the visual strips. Did you do a PowerPoint or is that a PowerPoint? Yes. So okay. it's literally just um, this. Yeah, we put these. It's each slide is is its own thing in a PowerPoint. Um, and then literally all you do, uh, May, if you can go all the way back to the beginning. So all you do is th these are this is just like a table in um, uh, in PowerPoint and you would just make 20 squares like this. And then, yeah, so you would just take away this one box. So you take away number 10 may go. Yep. Yeah, and then you just highlight that yellow box green. So you can see it, it's super easy. It's a click through every time. So each yeah. one of these, like five is its own slide, four is its own slide yeah. and so on. Yeah, and we, we're gonna share this PowerPoint at the end. Um, so you'll be able to just go through and copy and paste those 10 different slides and use them in your own. You should have said that from the beginning. We yeah. should have said that from the beginning. We're gonna You're move right. on panelists to the second question. Um, how have you seen physical educators that you co-teach with use visuals during remote learning? And how do you think that that has better helped our students with disabilities? Um, so I'm, I teach mostly um, inclusion and um, co-taught classes. So literally all my, my teachers that I work with are co-teachers. Um, and so what I see and some of those things that I'm gonna share are just, I have one teacher, a co-teacher, his wife is a special ed teacher. So he kind of already knows how to incorporate certain things. Um, but the biggest thing that a lot of my teachers have been doing is the timers and it, it benefits everybody. And you can find easy timers on YouTube. Um, you can find them with music, you can find them without music. Um, you can find them, if, maybe if you click on that last one, that one, it actually has a visual type countdown. Um, and some of that stuff is going to be provided to on an, another page. There's like, you can get egg timer, like there's all kinds of free stuff. So, but um, it provides the visual with a countdown. So that kind of, and the kids love these, even the gen ed kids, you know, because they know when they're done. So they're always constantly looking at the clock, <laughs> right? So, and then um, with the gifts, uh, the if you click on one of those lessons, so two of these are lessons from um, the one per, uh, teacher whose wife is a, a special ed teacher. The gifts are very um, one step. So there's like, just kind of like what May and Emma showed with um, each individual step. So each gift, like say for the juggling lesson that he put together is a separate step for each def different, you know, whether they're gonna throw up one scarf or two and it breaks down. So it's just the gift and the words. That's it, gift and then the words. And then, yeah, you have a lot of different slides, but it breaks it up for the kids and makes it a lot easier. So that they don't have, because obviously with the um, remotely, because I have some co-teachers that do this too, there can be too much visual as well. And that can also be a distraction. So you have to make sure that you keep it very simple and concise. Um, and then obviously the one benefit of being virtual is that you can actually add in arrows and use the, the contrast of color to help um, show things. So like when you click on this, these lessons from Forest Blend, it's a muscles lesson and it highlights the muscle with an arrow. So it says, this is this. And then you have the exercise with the gift of what, you know, what works that muscle. Um, and then a lot, of, a lot of you guys probably know these too about on YouTube, there's a lot of these nice interactive um, activities that people are putting together. And a lot of my kids um, who, you know, the the computer is their medium. That's what their motivator is. They love those kind of things, like to feel like they're inside of a video game and participating. So I don't know if anyone's here that's very creative like that. I'm not one of them. So I'm always getting them from YouTube, but <laughs> thank you guys for creating those, whoever's doing that, so. <laughs> How are we doing? We got more. Yeah, all the timers are going off at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Got a lot of technology. Here we go. <laughs> uh, one thing I just wanted to point out that uh, PE teachers in my district have been doing well with um, is just pointing out the expectations ahead of class time. So coming prepared to class, being on time, 
they just announce these at every start of class so that everybody knows the expectations while they're on Zoom. And then that's also presented for the students who are in person. It's just a good reminder for class expectations in general. Hey, may I follow up on that or any of the panelists. Do you guys see them putting the targets for the lesson more in visual form than they have in the past? I've seen that on, with teachers, you know, just listing their learning targets for the day. Sometimes they're tucked away on a bulletin board or something, but I see them using them more visually with this system. I have a share of that actually a little bit later on. Moving on slides, me. All right, we're uh, moving on to question number three. What systems um, are you guys currently using to progress monitor? Uh, can this be done remotely? And how have you used it in addition to progress monitoring? It, particularly, can you use it to support your programming, writing goals, those kinds of IEP uh, questions? I'm gonna go for it. <laughs> okay. Um, so we just have a, a quick progress monitoring sheet that we that we use. It's just a simple sheet. Uh, it's nothing nothing too crazy, um, but you can see here. This is kind of how we keep track of um, students' goals. So we'll we'll each student has their own tab on our sheets, um, and they've got their goal in there, and then we have their objectives. Uh, this student has more than this, but this is just an example. Um, and this is kind of where we we keep track of everything. Um, so you know we'll put the date in there. We'll we'll do we'll make notes about the activity, and this kind of helps us keep our data all in one place. Um, but as far as like progress monitoring their goal, um, if you want to click on that other tab in there, oops, um, I just created just based off the TGMD three. I took the, those criteria for the ball skills, um, and I just put those into uh, right here this sheet here, and it basically. So we we're in this student's goal. He's look. We're looking at the criteria um, and how many times he can hit a certain number of criteria in each um, in each ball skill. So literally, all we do is if we're working on overhand throwing, this is simple. I can have my iPad there right with me, um, and you know we can look at each each thing. And are they doing it? Yes. No. You know, if I check it off, they did it. If I if they didn't, I don't check it off. And then that has just some trials um, as we go through the year. Uh, so again, something pretty simple. Um, you know, we all we always want to keep track of some prompting and that kind of stuff. See if they're doing it independently or not. Um, but yeah, the, this spreadsheet will be in um, in the PowerPoint at the end, so you will be able to click on this um, and use this for yourself. And we it's we use it for all goals too. So not just if we're working on specific skills, but we use it for fitness and participation type goals too. But it's just an easy place for us to keep track of all the students' goals. And Kathy's up. Yeah, you've got some stuff. You need to unmute Kathy. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Along the same lines as Emma and May is, again, it's just kind of a checklist. And the one to the right, where it's the volleyball, I can checklist, trying to make it as positive as possible. And just as they're going through the activity, observing and checking off what they've been able to do. I've just done it with like one or two check marks. I try to at least do at least three observations of what they can do. And um, just recently, I try, instead of having dealing with so many different papers, I transferred it over into the content facilitation grid, where it's basically the same type of information, just in a different format. And this way, I can list all my students and have one sheet instead of flipping through all the different kids, because sometimes, you know, I may have five kids in a class, and I'm not looking through all these different papers to find which you know, which paper is which kid. So, um, and then I, I have found just using a very simple code of beginning, emerging or mastering. And it's whether there, it's a goal or it's just observation because the having the data on just observation for me has helped me to target some of the goals that they need or just strength, strengths and weaknesses 
or when writing up their present level functioning, um, you know, having that kind of information. Now, these two are more of a daily basis. And if you look at uh, the third one down, I can checklist. So I have the, um, th that's a folder to everything. That may be too much to show right there, but it, it's a folder for all different, you know, volleyball, basketball, hockey, several different units. So at least you have the task analysis that if you did want to change it into a content facilitation type format, it's available for you. I just didn't change all of those over yet. Um, I'm assuming that this the, the grid like this will work better for me, but I haven't had as much experience with it as the I can checklist. So, but what I do do with these then is I go to the elements rubric and um, that is record, I record those quarterly and I continue it from year to year. I just have tabs down at the bottom. And I also use those for when I develop students goals, it does hit with the standards. And so the parents will get, and it is, it's on landscape. And so it, it's pretty long, but um, I color code it according to how many times I'm observing. And I feel like the parents have said, yes, I mean, they can look at it in two minutes. If you guys have ever been in IEP meetings, it's the, you know, all those academics are, you're spending all that time on, and then you get to PE. And it's like, okay, we got two minutes, two minutes to tell everything that the kids have been doing and where they're going. And when I do give this to parents, I feel like they, they've already listened to so much on academics, but this is a quick view once it is filled out, um, according to how many times have they seen the student, you know, how many times have I seen the student um, in basketball, do a chest pass, receive a chest pass, do an overhead throw. So, um, and it's color coded. And what I can tell the parents is the more blue you see, the more times your child is demonstrating this in class. Or then if you move down lower, it also goes into um, the, them working with peers because I specifically work with a full inclusion program. I don't have self-contained students. So parents, is one of their priorities is how, how is uh, my child interacting with their, peer, with their peers and um, how are they doing when they interact? So again, if they're looking, if they're seeing more of the blue, they're, they're having more success with interacting with those peers or white, it hasn't been, a, been touched on at all. Again, going down for the uh, accommodations or modifications, I use those same color codings. And if they're seeing more blue, it's they're requiring less modifications, less assistance, or they're, they have more independence in those areas. And hopefully, if they're seeing more blue on the top with the skills that they're doing, they'll be seeing more blue on the bottom with the amount of um, requirements that they need. So I do use these um, forms for, you know, like the last uh, IEP goal I made was that so-and-so would demonstrate two elements, um, you know, in a quarter according to each unit. Or if they have been um, making progress, what the high schools like, you know, I like the high schools to see too once they're transitioning is, yes, they've done all this, but they're still able to learn more. So one of their goals might be um, to demonstrate an increase. So parents would get the, their um, basically a baseline and they would get the uh, rubrics showing everything they can do. And then upon the completion of the goal, they would see all these different areas that they increased in skill or increased in independence. So um, I feel like my families have been pretty uh, satisfied with it. I myself also at the very bottom will put, will add in their fitness goals or just their fitness scores from each of the years. And then their IEP goals very generally, like um, two elements met goal, you know, just kind of as a track of where they're going throughout their years in the middle school. So. Thank you, Kathy. We're gonna move on to our next uh, question here. Um, cause we have lots of questions and we got to get through all of them. Uh, one thing I did want to address, I, I, 
somebody had mentioned the SOPA uh, law that's going to go into effect. Yes, anytime you're taking data, um, those are, are going to be more permanent records now. So those data sheets will be available to lawyers, parents, et cetera. So um, we're still waiting on um, the uh, rollout of that. The law has been written, but the actual legal definitions and stuff will, will come later. So um, check with your school administrators on that, uh, particularly if you're someone who's taking data, you need to be aware of that and how it's going to become more of a permanent record than a, than a soft uh, uh, record for, for students with disabilities. So. Um, I'm suspecting in the fall, there'll be a lot of legal um, opinions about that. And also your districts will be looking to the lawyers for um, how, how you're gonna roll that out. Good questions. Um, so question number four, how have you guys incorporated SEL goals into your lessons, particularly remotely? And uh, have you addressed SEL in general during this difficult time with students? Okay, so I'm gonna I'm head on this one because um, I don't know if, if you guys are familiar with Dr. Don Hollison. So in the teaching te teaching personal social responsibility model, um, which is basically um, a format, it's a teaching style, but um, its foundation is in the principles of SEL learning, obviously. So and basically, with that premise being student empowerment. Okay, and how can we empower our students remotely, basically? And so. Um, these are just some strategies I'm putting out. So like allowing your kids time for sharing. Um, and I know it's hard because like I have one elementary class that's only 20 minutes long and you're like, oh my gosh, you only got 20 minutes with them. However, those relationships are so important. And I have like one kid who's got, he's the first thing he's got to do is he's got to show me something that he made or cut or whatever. And he's got to tell me about it, you know, but it only takes like 30 seconds, you know what I'm saying? And then he's got it out and then we're good, you know? So, but allowing him to be able to do that, you know, now he can keep going, you know, um, and like, as you've been seeing in a lot of our slides with all of our kids, um, but just actually just our gen ed kids too, because I also teach peer body programs at the high school um, and they want to do, they want choice, they want power, especially now our high schoolers are struggling big time. I see more of a struggle with, with the older kids than I do with the younger kids. I have high school as well as elementary and um, they're really struggling socially, emotionally. Like, and um, I know we, in my high schools that we do, we actually have specific SEL lessons and they are just eating up these strategies of like mental health and, you know, being mindful practices and just having time to be able to, you know, think about ways that they can, you know, deal with their stress and handle their anxieties and things like that. So having those conversations as well is, um, it's, it's okay. You know, um, during this time, everything's different. So it's like, it's okay to kind of just throw out the ball and, or not throw out the ball, but kind of throw the old traditional things away and, and say, okay, we have to take time for these kind of things. And if you are familiar with Hellison's work, that's kind of what his premise is. It's a different style of teaching. And even though you, you're you still teaching and leading, your kids are directing your, your, your teaching. Um, so interview your students. I'm always asking my students questions. Um, and granted, some of them can find them super annoying, but you got to find out what their interests are. And that helps drag, especially those older kids out. Um, they, they don't, sometimes, I'm sure you guys are finding this too. They like to keep their cameras off. They don't want to talk. They don't want to do anything. They just want to keep, you know, they just want to be there, be present and that's it. You know, so trying to get them to draw them out is kind of like, oh, you know, what do you do? So um, I have one benefit, which may not always benefit everybody else, but with my peer um, classes, I have, especially I have night and day class, actually. I have one peer class where the buddies interact. We do um, breakout groups and the buddies help teach um, the programs. We put together a game or something and they're, they're leading the activity um, with, our, with our kids. And, um, but then I have another class where the kids are more shy and they don't wanna, they don't wanna engage. They, they're, they're in the class, but they were expecting obviously to be in person as opposed to be remote. And then some of them aren't able to, you know, be in person, even though they have hybrid right now. So how do you get them to engage when they're already shy on the camera? They're afraid to show their face. So I just tried the same strategy with them. I'm like, we got to get them to talk. So we put, we played a Jeopardy game and I gave them each a job. One of you has to be the sheriff. One of you has to be the moderator. One of you has to keep track of the score. And now they're all having to engage. And amazingly, 
they were all done at the end of the class. They were smiling. They were all like, oh my gosh, this was the best. This is the best, you know, but yet they're still shy and afraid. So you have to kind of draw it out from them, you know? Um, and another thing is just be open also to sharing of yourself because the more you like, it's okay to be, to be vulnerable and a little bit open because you're showing your human side. And, and kids want to be able to see that, you know, yeah, we, they put their teachers like on pedestals and kind of thing. And they think, oh my gosh, it's kind of like when you, as PE teachers, you all know when we dress in regular clothes, everyone's like, oh my gosh, you like look normal. You know, it's kind of the same thing. You know, you, you, you have to be able to share those weird things. Like I have a cat that loves to sit during all my, my classes, you know, but he's a conversation starter, you know, and, and it's like, it's a great thing to kind of get kids to start opening up a little bit. So it's a different topic. Um, and if you go to the next slide, this is, I don't have time to like show this. So this is definitely a programming thing, but I use Pear Deck or things like this to try to help my lessons be interactive. So Pear Deck, what the nice thing is, is it's an add-on from Google Slides. And what's really awesome about it, you have to pay for the drag and the draw feature. However, you can ask, um, do simple like um, multiple choice questions. And I think, I can't remember the other, but they have some free options. But the nice thing that I have like with the draw feature, the district that I pay for actually has to pay for the feature, is that my kids who are nonverbal, they can just go on their iPad. Most of them have iPads. So it's projected. They can take their finger and just drag to wherever they feel, okay? Or it's a simple way to also interact with those kids because I have a kid who is um, learning how to use his, his AAC device. And so we were teaching him how to use it by helping him drag by making choices. Say like if we were doing a... Um, you know, like the, those this or that activities. Um, so he would drag his dot to just to, to choose which thing he wanted. Um, but the, so those are ways he was engaging. And before he would not gauge pretty much in any other class. But when it came to be heat with that schedule and being able to interact, he was starting to engage. And he was actually starting to learn how to use his AAC device too. So just some simple strategies. But again, it's technology based, which you do have to learn how to to know how to learn that to, or use that stuff. So. Are there any questions about social emotional stuff? Well, thank you, Karen. There's a lot of uh, good chatter going on about your topic on social emotional learning, and we love to um, hear about it. And when Karen gets back in person, she's going to do some more uh, TPSR uh, uh, types of stuff for us and in conventions as well. So thank you. Um, where Gustan had asked a question about uh, coordinating national, state, and uh, local uh, information to adaptive P planning. We're not going to get into that today, but we're happy to chat with you at another time. Uh, you have all of our Twitter feeds, so um, that will not be a topic tonight, but we would love to talk to you about how we coordinate uh, across all uh, domains. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get into uh, another question, uh, question five. Adapted physical educators are notorious for adapting equipment uh, to meet individual needs. How have you gotten creative this year with uh, changing things around, other than all these awesome visuals that you guys have been using? Sorry. Um, so <laughs> the biggest thing for me is because I, I'm, I'm not technology deficient, but I definitely have my weaknesses in certain areas. Um, I can catch on kind of quick in some things. So for me, the biggest thing has been being able to just learn all the resources that are out there online that I can actually incorporate because everything I have to do is remote. I have no in-person um, any with any of my classes. They won't even let me set foot <laughs> in the buildings. So um, uh, Jiffy Cat is one resource where you can get free gifts. Um, basically. Um, you have to know how to download them, but if you go to, if you go on Jiffy Cat and you look up the Health Finder and Fitness Bender, those are specific, um, uh, I don't know what you call it, like, I don't know what they're called in the virtual world, but they have just all fitness gifts, okay? So, and they have a, a, like a plethora of, of choices. And then I found the Special Olympics YouTube channel. They have some great um, activities and, and YouTube um, channels and stuff, as well as the Pear Deck add-on is what I was telling you about, but that, again, you have to pay for the premium to get the drag, drag and the draw feature. Um, another thing is Name of Wheels. 
um, nameofwheels.com. You can basically put make a wheel out of anything. I've made a wheel that has locomotors on it. I made a wheel, you can put pictures of exercises on it. You can make a wheel with kids' names on it. You know, so you can make a wheel with anything and save it. So um, it's free. And then I discovered this year, derby.com, which is awesome for your high school, those older kids. They literally have like anything that you can imagine in regards to, and you can click on that actually, Emma. I think I have the link to that so people can see that. Um, they have a plethora of activities that you can do and you can actually even go down, if you click on where it says workouts, you can on the top there, you can go to the different types of workouts and you're on an iPad, so it might not show you on the side, but it also comes up, oh no, uh, put on, click on load filter. So now you see on the side, you can break this down and you can look for, if you kind of scroll on the side, the filter, you can look for hit workouts. You can work just upper bodies. You can work just stretching. You can work, you know, low intensity, high intensity. And they like, it's great. It gives you all kinds of ideas and things. Um, and I have the kids go to that too as well. Um, if you could go back, cause I don't remember some of my other stuff. Oh, the dice roller and the egg timer. Um, like I said, you can find timers all over YouTube. Um, as well as the egg timers. And then of course, obviously the, full, the Fulmer's page has uh, got a lot of nice resources as well. They even have actually the Google the, the Google slides, the games and stuff. You can find some of that, but that's where I got like Jeopardy and um, the, lots of this or that kind of stuff. So you can find a lot of stuff on there too. So, and then the next ones, this is kind of the biggest thing that I've learned. So being able to use those Google slides to make schedules as Kathy was refer re referring to. So this, my kids actually love this, so they know what's gonna happen, okay? They see what's coming, and then every time you click, if you keep going, one of my colleagues actually came up, you, you cross it off. And now this one, I like, in taking a, a different turn on um, May and Emma's, every time the student makes a catch, a number comes up. And you can use that, basically that same feature, but you'd have to really know Google Slides because you have to animate it. So, but then when you get it all done, say they do five, then you can put up the all done, okay? So it's kind of nice and makes it interactive because it makes it more game-like, which a lot of my kids like, so. All right, and we got a little chatter in there. Um, and so keep looking, keep chatting it up guys. And if we don't get to your question, uh, repeat it and we'll make sure we do because the chat is hopping tonight. So anyhow, can you guys give me examples of how, how you've, uh, I'm sorry, wrong question. What have we learned about parents as partners in this whole process? Um, many of you have said that you, you know your parents better than ever after all this. And this is one of the things that's really come out um, with this remote learning that has been um, helpful in a lot of ways. So. How do you know parents as partners even better now? I'm gonna jump in with this one. A couple of pictures here just represent how active my students have been during um, synchronous sessions. Um, there's a couple of pictures of my students that are circled in yellow. And most times with all of my kids, they have some adult there with them, um, helping support in some way or the other. So what I found is that my teaching now isn't necessarily geared towards my students, it's geared towards teaching the parents how to work with their kid. And I think that they have become so much more appreciative of adapted PE in general, just by learning more about what we're doing and kind of seeing some of the things that we're putting into place for their students. And I have had many conversations now with my parents that they're understanding more the value that adapted PE has brought into their students' lives. So that has been incredible. And even furthering those conversations and making them part of the adapted PE plan. So we have a student who has an evaluation coming up and I've had a conversation with that parent of what is your goal for your student? What, what do you want them to get out of PE? Um, 
what do you do as a family to stay active? So we're teaching that student those skills in order to become a lifelong mover or in order to be able to participate in those activities with a family outside of school. And that has been so rewarding for me in many aspects and I think also for the families, which has been amazing. I'm gonna jump in on this one um, and I'm gonna toot May's horn a little bit. I know she's been uh, really focused on getting to working with the parents that she's seeing on Zoom um, and that's allowing her to include some other parents um, that maybe she's not seeing on Zoom, but like she said, she's reaching out during IEP times and really trying to get families involved in um, kind of their students um, program as far as APE goes. Um, I'm going to speak to uh, kind of the behavior side of this too. Um, there have been a couple times where I've been uh, in a remote session with students and um, they have shown physical behaviors towards their parents. Um, and it, it gives us the opportunity to kind of teach parents uh, maybe some other ways to combat those behaviors and maybe uh, kind of dissect why that behavior happened during that time um, and helping them not just with you know throwing a ball or doing a squat or doing anything like that, but allowing them the opportunity to see um, you know how we would deal with a behavior in class. Um, so it's kind of opened a door into us helping parents at home because I'm sure you all have worked with parents that are struggling at home with their students who have more severe disabilities. So it it really gives us an opportunity to help them out in that way too. So. Um, I've found that really beneficial and, um, you know, there's a lot of parents who look at PE and P and APE teachers as, oh, you're just the gym teacher, but when you're able to show them your value um, when it comes to behaviors and APE in general, um, I, I think it really, it really helps. And then when you see them in IEP meetings, they um, see a familiar face and uh, you just have created those deeper, deeper relationships with parents that we would have never had the opportunity to do in person. There's one other thing that I wanted to tag on that you guys said too. I also feel like I'm, I'm teaching, so like the, a lot of my parents are learning what their kids are, are capable to do. Like sometimes they, they're not sure what they can do with their kids. And I've been getting videos from, from parents that'll be like, oh my gosh, look, they like show what they're doing like on the weekends, you know, like the activities that they're able to, to do now, you know, that they didn't know their kids could do. So it's really cool. So question I didn't pose to you earlier, but I'm gonna pose right now is, how do you think you'll incorporate parents as partners in a, in a more thoughtful way as you get back to full-time um, learning in person? Um, I can, I can kind of share a discussion that May and I've had about that. Uh, we want to create some sort of Google form um, that can be sent out to parents um, either at the, we do send out student interest surveys um, at the beginning of the year, just to get an idea, like you saw on our choice boards and then um, some specific visuals. We do send out Google Forms at the beginning of the year to get that information from parents, um, but we want to send something out that um, will allow them some sort of say in what they want their students to be learning in PE, if there's something important that they do, you know, if they're a soccer family and they really want their student with autism to be able to kick a ball around in the backyard with their brother or sister, you know, that that's something if they want their student to be able to walk down the street without falling to the ground and, you know, kind of refusing. Um, so we want to be able to send something out to parents in the future um, about what they're looking for out of APE from their student. We had a lot of chatter about um, just re-engaging students that aren't in front of the screen when, you know, they're flitting around the room or whatever and uh, having a hard time with screen time. How, have you guys had any specifics with how to engage parents and or students during that time for those kind of students that just can't sit still, right? <laughs> we don't want them to sit still, but you know what I'm saying. I have a, a student like that and um, he, we, we're slowly working up his tolerance basically. So like there's days obviously that he's not there at all. 
you know, and then the days that he is there using that, the, the one schedule that I shared with you, you know, that schedule helps engage him in those interactive type inter activities. I find, um, I know we haven't gotten into this, but I find sometimes for some of those kids that are like really like the computer, you know, like the iPads kind of their motivator, the, the Google Slides is really uh, great for that. So like being able to engage them somehow um, electronically through the through the remotely um, helps them at least stay there for a little while. And then like his tolerance right now is only 15 minutes out of 20, but that built, you know what I'm saying? So like it was, it started out maybe like seven, you know, and now it's gradually slowly got over the course of the year keeps getting a little bit longer. So, you know, it's just, it's a work in progress. <laughs> Anybody else on student engagement for screen I think, time? I think Karen Karen put it perfectly that it, it's a working <laughs> in progress. <laughs> um, I would say it goes back to maybe the initial uh, aspect of figuring out what the student is interested in and developing your lesson around that. And like Karen was also saying, kind of building up their tolerance. So. So what can they tolerate with their interests? And maybe you put in an unpreferred thing every once in a while and then go back to some sort of preferred and, and give frequent breaks as needed. Um, that's that's my addition experience. I would also um, I would also go back to kind of our choice board and our first then um, using that virtually. Uh, that might be able to draw them into the screen, um, but that is definitely a hard thing. And I think we've all dealt with that and we're all gonna continue to deal with that. Um, so great question. And I think there are great suggestions, uh, but keep working at it. You'll you'll get them. I'm in, a, I'm in a little bit different position than you guys were. I'm more with the inclusive. And so, um, you know, we're just trying to keep up with those typical peers that are doing everything maybe from a YouTube that is going fast paced or, but what I've learned to work a lot more collaboratively with the gen ed teachers because they're realizing more what my kids can or can't do and just more open to, we can do breakout rooms. And it's not just break, you know, my students going into a separate breakout room, but sometimes some of the other peers or they're, they'll do a whole class, um, a whole class activity where there's a lot of different breakout rooms. And that has helped my students a lot is because then there's not so many kids to look at and you can slow things down for them. And I've had a couple of times they're ready for just a, a breakdown and we got into a breakout room. We were able to process and you're not processing in, in front of the whole class and being able to come back. But it's having that gen ed teacher knowing and you advocating you know, on the spot to make sure that they know what needs to be done in that Zoom meeting in order to have your, your students still participating and um, participating productively, so. Well, I want to say on that, Go um, ahead. Yeah, good, yeah, because uh, with co-teachers and to, trust me, I mean, I've dealt with a lot of different types of co-teachers and, and you can, you know, you have to work on those relationships slowly as well, because obviously you can, you can say so much, you know what I'm saying? And it really depends. I had one lady, I swear to you, it took me eight years to finally get her to actually like be open to our kids being in the room and being able to be how they are, you know? So it's like, it really depends on that teacher and you have to find your way to kind of like forge that relationship with them. So you can kind of, you might have to drop suggestions like a little bit here and there you know how about doing this or you know but you'll know um how your relationship is but yeah you have to work on those relationships with those co-teachers too as well well thank you guys we have one last question we're wrapping up our hour how has all of this made you a better teacher i i'll jump in I've just become more aware of the students, more, you know, their mental, uh, um, their mental state kind of, because, um, you know, we see so many different behaviors and we just assume that's just a part of their autism. And now I feel like I can put it more into, I, I, I don't know, analyze it or put it more into place of this is why they're having some of the problems. And these are some more of the reasons uh, you know, the, the ways we can go about to help support them, but not only the students, but knowing the parents and the situation that they're in, what is realistic, what is really doable, and, um, you know, the obstacles and struggles that they're dealing with under this situation, too. 
Don't all talk at once. How have you <laughs> <a> teacher? <laughs> do, do we want to leave a couple minutes for questions? Like, do, does anyone? I do want to share one thing before we do that. So for me, like, obviously, like I said, technology is the biggest thing. But then the other thing, and, you know, coming from a district where I was like, I was running around like a, 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 a rabbit. Like I was constantly going, 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 going. And I'm more able to interact with my team remotely. And it's so important, like being able to ask my team question. And I mean the whole team, not just, you know, your special ed teachers, your psychologists, blah, blah, blah. I also mean like the parents. I can ask my PE teachers, like engaging everybody. Um, I'm really enjoying being able to engage everybody in, in the team, so. All right, guys. Well, we're wrapping up. Thank you all panelists for uh, just uh, laying it out there and talking. Uh, we've had a lot of chatter. Uh, did we not, if you did not get to a question, go ahead and put it back in and we will try to get to it real quick. As we're wrapping up, we wanna um, particularly thank uh, Becky and Mark Fulmer, Eric Chan, Bill Casey, and everybody behind the scenes who have uh, seamlessly put on this uh, event for us. Uh, there's a lot of technology in the background to be able to do that. I appreciate all the other people uh, putting things in chat as well, because we've got a lot going on. We can learn from each other. We are going to um, share all this information with you. And May, if you want to talk about our next event and, uh, and go to your next slide there and uh, talk about that. Yep. Yeah. Sounds great. Yes, again, thank you, everybody. Thank you to everyone behind the scenes who made this happen. Beck, M Becky, Mark, Bill, thank you for all of your help. Um, the next event we are putting on through ICAPE is that we are attempting to recruit some new members for um, the ICAPE leadership team. So we are hosting an ICAPE meet and greet um, just to learn more about what we do and gauge interest about if anybody wants to join the leadership team. So that is gonna be on March 9th at 7.30 uh, via Zoom. There is a link and that will also be coming out um, via Twitter and our newsletter as well. So be on the lookout for, for the sign up link and then you'll get the Zoom link from there. And lastly, Twitter. An amazing way to collaborate with everybody. If you're not on it, get on it and follow us. We've got adapted PE teachers from all over the nation here. Let's give a shout out. Brian's from Colorado. We got people farther away. We're glad to meet you guys. We should be doing more of these nationally as well. I'm working on getting the link to the slides put in right now too. So give me just a second. Well, you're... Um, while you're doing that, uh, I just uh, I want to just thank uh, Kathy for for moderating, and I also want to thank the the panelists uh, May, Emma, Kathy, and Karen. I really appreciate this this conversation. And yeah, the chat uh, the the conversation in the chat box was uh, really on fire tonight, and and is really exciting to see so many of you participating in not only the chat but also within this uh, conversation. I do have to also uh, follow up with all of those thank yous that you were, you were mentioning, some of the key people that were behind this three month uh, adventure, uh, obviously Bill Casey and uh, Becky Fulmer and Eric Chan, uh, uh, Rebecca Myers and uh, Kelly Zerby, a real solid core of people uh, within the technology uh, committee of IAFERD. And I do have to, I know you're sharing out information on your upcoming events, but I also want to share out uh, a reminder to everyone before this month is over, be sure to view the sessions you are interested in seeing in order to receive those professional development hours. Once February is over, the sessions will still be available to you uh, all the way through May, but at, after or beginning March 1, you won't be able to receive those professional development hours. So if you're looking to get that squared away, make sure you uh, spend some time in these last couple of days in the month of February. I also want to encourage all of you to be sure to keep Thursday evenings open for future IAFERT events. 
Uh, we will continue to host our IAFERD uh, Twitter chats. Uh, our next chat, in fact, will be next week, Thursday, and it will be hosted by Kyle Bragg, who is an Illinois State University graduate uh, in health and physical education. He currently teaches down in Arizona. And on the nights when we do not have a Twitter chat scheduled, you'll find that we'll be hosting future live roundtable discussions. We'll also be offering featured webinars and some quick hits uh, that we've, we've started during this, this time frame. So keep it right here on Thursday evenings for everything IAFERD. And uh, uh, before uh, everyone gets away, any last words from, from our adapted physical education people? We just thank you for coming. Keep teaching those kiddos, huh? <laughs> yes, thank you, everyone. We really appreciate it. And we're looking forward to what's next. And you have all our Twitter, so you can get a hold of us or message us. Thanks. Oh.